Uh, welcome this afternoon uh, to another Super Speed Golf webinar. We're extremely excited to have some really smart people on this call today. Um, Greg Sabella from Blast Motion is going to be joining us, as well as Dr. Tyler Standiford of uh, Utah Valley University. So, guys, how, how are we doing this afternoon? Everybody good? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, yeah really, good to be here. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm really excited to, you know, really look at some of this kind of hands on stuff that we can do now with blast motion and super speed. Uh, we're going to take a deep look at that here in a little bit. Um, Tyler's also going to be uh, sharing a little bit of information on some of the higher, even higher tech type things that are out there in the world. Because um, what we really want to do this afternoon is give everybody a good overview. First of all, of what 3D motion capture is. Uh, what blast motion does and how those systems can integrate really well into the training that we've created for super speed golf. And I want to share a little bit too about how to use that system in order to really optimize and get the most out of your speed training. Okay, so we're going to just do a couple little little quick presentation and then we're going to open this up for a ton of questions uh, later on. If you have a question while we're going, please type it in the Q&A panel. Uh, Kyle Shea is also with us here. He's going to be moderating. Uh, he's going to answer some of those questions on text, and then we'll have some others that we'll answer live toward the end of the webinar. Okay, so starting out, um, I'm one that in, in my coaching career as a PGA professional and running a golf academy for a long time, I'm one of those that got really into the high tech stuff. I mean, I used all kinds of different 3D motion capture technology from some of the most complicated that's out there to some of the most simple. And I know Tyler's lab out in Utah is probably one of the most technologically advanced labs this side of the country. I'll let him talk about that in a little bit here. The first thing that I want to talk about when we look at 3D motion capture is really what we're measuring. So if we think about video, video is taking a series of still pictures and then we're playing them back really fast so that our eyes see this moving image okay so what what that does is that actually measures what we're looking at in two dimensions we can see how things move left and right and up and down but we can really only guess at how it's moving with any kind of rotation or really even how it's moving in that third dimension so if we think of everything that we do in the golf swing or just movement in general, we can move in three different directions. So if we're standing up to a golf ball, I am able to move to and from that golf ball. I can move to or away from my target, and I can also move up and down relative to the ground. Those would be our three basic axes of movement. Now, only your extremely expensive 3D motion capture systems are really able to capture and quantify a lot of the data that you're getting in these positional movements in the golf swing. The one that more systems measure are, what are rotations or what we call orientation. So I can also rotate around any one of those different axes that we just had in 3D or three-dimensional motion. And now we call that in the 3D world six degrees of freedom. So if we think about that in the golf swing, you know, if I'm jumping up and down and I'm moving in a rotary movement around that, that's going to be what I'm looking at when I measure basically like rotation in the golf swing. How much torso turn do I have or those type of things. If I'm looking at how I rotate around that axis going to and from the target, that's going to be am I forward bending, am I extending. And then if I'm rotating around that axis to and from the ball, this is where I could get side tilt with shoulders higher, those type of things. So those are your basic movements when we start to talk about 3D. Now again, some of these systems that we deal with to measure this are extremely complicated and they're really only like research grade type equipment. Um, this one's a really advanced optical system that has a whole bunch of different cameras looking at the player and measuring their movement. Now this is something similar to what Tyler has in your lab, correct? Yeah, so this is this is cool, Mike. And I like how you talked about the idea of like, you know, maybe these research grade equipment that's maybe measuring every single movement under the sun at incredible uh, frequencies, frames per second, multiple camera angles to build these 3D models. You know, and then we're seeing new technologies that do things that you're know, trying to recreate these. And, and I think it's important to understand that 
you know, there's going to be the spectrum of what we can can do, right? These these we're going to always have these research grade things that are going to be able to to get more of the fine tuned movements, and then hopefully we can you know start to utilize other other technologies the right way and the data that they're accurate with to look at other things as well. But as Mike described, I have a lab similar to this where. I have both kind of an optical sensor where I can put little markers over people's bodies, have them hop on my force plates, have them swing the golf club. Uh, just today, I was getting set up my multi-camera markerless system um, that, uh, that I'm, I'm getting ready to go and we'll start doing data collections on this winter. And again, I'm fortunate to be at a university, Mike, that that allows me to do this kind of research and, and puts a lot of support. I actually got a text message from one of our vice presidents today and he said, hey, the president wants to come check out your golf lab because she's going to start taking golf lessons. And she thought your golf lab might be a great place to start. And I said, hey, bring her on down. So it's a cool place to be. So that's a really cool point that I want to make on this as well. So that technology that you have in your lab, you know, is the data it spits out is extremely complicated. There's a lot of it. You know, I know that when we worked with these systems at our golf academy, I would never show our student a lot of this data or that's not going to really help them. You know, I like to look at this type of thing as like an MRI of your golf swing. You know, when you go to the doctor and you get an MRI, you want somebody to read it for you and, you know, tell you what's going on. You know, if they just, you got an MRI and they just handed you all of these scans and you're looking at it like, well, what do I do with this? You know, so I think that that's an area that I think is really interesting. When we look at this research grade equipment. Um, this is actually the type of system we used at our academy, which is an electromagnetic system. So this is actually downside here is you got wires connected to it because all these little sensors need power, right? So it can also measure very accurately the way a player moves. And again, this is more of that for the coach, for the researcher type person, so that we can really identify exactly what's going on with a player. Now, as we move into the future and, and we've gotten into the, now, you know, also down to equipment that is not only, I think, really good to use for the player, but it's also cost effective for the player to use to get better. We start to look at sensors like BLAST. Now, BLAST in its you know truest form is what we call an inertial sensor. So BLAST doesn't really measure all of those six degrees of freedom. It really focuses on measuring those orientations or how that club's rotating in space. You know, but that gives us a lot of data when we start to look at what's going on. Greg, you want to just kind of talk a little bit about you know, some of those details of what's in a BLAST sensor and how it works? Yeah, it's a great, great segue. And, and just going back to the lab for a second, the first lab looks like our lab at BLAST too. So we, we test our sensor versus those big data gathering gear systems and optical mocap systems. And the wires is, believe it or not, kind of how BLAST started. Wires down the shaft of a golf club and a big you know, ball on the end of it, trying to measure everything. Again, the challenge with that stuff is one, the wires, two, the weight of the golf club changes tremendously when you put all those things on it. So you're not actually capturing a true golf swing, you're capturing a swing of somebody making their motions, but with a, a different club or with a heavier club. Um, our sensor itself is a, is a very intelligent little piece of equipment. It's got two accelerometers, a gyroscope, a magnetometer, and a battery all inside a little sensor that weighs 0.3 ounces and is about the size of a nickel or a few nickels stacked together. The benefit of that is we can capture slow speed movements very, very well rotational movements at a very high speed very, very well. And we, we have kind of a clock, a speedometer, and a compass all wrapped into one to be able to give players information that would be very hard to gather accurately without one of these huge systems in place. Right. So, I think <laughs> another thing that's incredibly important here to add, Greg, is the app that you guys have that connects to this sensor is amazing. So in that same sense, you know, this sensor can collect a lot of data, but how that's presented to the player, we essentially have a, an app running AI here that's that doctor that's already telling you all of the different pieces of data that you can get. You can program it to, you know, only give you feedback on certain points. I think that's a really cool aspect as well. It is, and it goes, you know, really deep into the weeds if you want to go that route, or we can hide some things and show some simplified screens to really get down to working on one or two things. So, 
you know, my goal every day is to improve the app to make it more user friendly. And believe it or not, a lot of that time is spent trying to simplify the app to make it easily digestible because you can get really deep into the weeds if you really want to, um, which is great. But I think for most players looking at surface level, figuring out what you need to work on and then diving down is a better tact and, and makes it a little more comprehensible. All right. So let's talk about the next piece of this. And that is how to get the right stuff on this app as far as what we want to see and why we're going to do that. So why is it important and why did Super Speed Golf go and partner with Blast Motion in, in the first place? I mean, yeah, we're on our end, we're all tech nuts. We love this stuff, but everything that we have done at Super Speed is to help you hit the ball further off the tee, have more fun playing golf and do that in a fast and easy way. Well, this comes into one of my favorite sciences that is out there in the world, and that's human motor learning. Now, you don't know this necessarily unless you've seen a lot of our webinars or gone through our certifications or done those things, but there's a whole lot of science behind why we do our protocols the way we do with super speed and how we recommend to get feedback when you're going through that training. So I like to look at this first piece of it as a concept called discovery learning. So discovery learning has to do with a person, in this case, in the golf world, trying to figure out on their own how to make a specific improvement. Now, as a coach, I'm providing the specific drills, the number of sets and reps. I'm asking you to go through a process of doing these different swings when you go through your super speed golf training that is meant to help you discover what it feels like to swing faster. Now, here's the kicker, though. If I have you go out on the driving range and go through our super speed protocol and swing aggressively, what's going to happen in a bunch of those different swings? Is every single one of them going to go faster during the training? Well, I hope so, but it's, it's not what happens every time. A lot of times what happens is one swing, you might tense up and grip really aggressively, and you know, maybe that, that speed goes down just a little bit. And then on the next one, maybe everything smooths out, you use the ground a little more effectively, maybe you sequence better. You know, there's a lot of different things that could make your swing go faster, but then you see the speed go up, and now all of a sudden you remember that it feels like that to go faster. That idea of remembering what it feels like when I did it right, is the basic basis behind discovery learning and I would say is one of the fastest ways in the science of human motor learning for you to get better and increase swing speed. Now, what is the specific idea that we talk about when you remember what that feels like is something we call feedback. Now, that's a really simple thing, right? If I don't know if it went faster, if I don't know if it went slower, that's not going to be as efficient of a learning process as if I know how every one of those swings reacted uh, when I do that training. So again, we're coupling some technology here so that we can provide the easiest feedback for you to have while you're going through this training so that you can remember what it feels like to go faster, track your progress, and see your speed gains you know, as quickly as you possibly can. I'm going to get this off of here now. Um, in just a minute, we're going to go through this actual app and show you exactly how this works. But, you know, Tyler, I'm just curious because, you know, you've put a lot of people through studies working with super speed golf and various pieces of technology and blast. You know, do you think it's important for people to be able to remember what those feels are that help them go faster? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you you give a lot of the science behind it, right, in this motor learning and, and how we actually learn tasks. But, you know, feedback is such an essential part of this process. One, some of my favorite things when I actually work with golfers in my lab and I bring them in and they take that first swing with the super speed club and I'm like, okay, all right, let's let I give them the speed number uh, either, uh, you know, with the with the blast app, which I've been using a lot lately. And I say, hey, this was 105. Uh, do you think you got faster than let's try and try and think about what you did. And then they swing a little bit faster and then I can kind of step out and just say, okay, notice what that felt like. Um, and honestly, my favorite ones to watch, Mike, are when these golfers start making non-dominant swings, because that is a wonderful way to elicit an incredible response from the neuro, kind of the neuro connection of brain to body. There's so much great research about there that we've talked about and I've researched, but you watch them really step back, think a little bit, figure it out, see that number, step back and see that number go up, up and up. 
I even had a, a golfer who he gained a lot of speed with his. He texted me after about four weeks and he said, watching those numbers in the non-dominant swings has helped me really learn how to move fast. And I think that really captures perfectly what you're describing. Outstanding. All right. Well, Mike, Greg, we want to throw this app up. Yeah, absolutely. Just to add to that before I jump in there is, you know, you're touching on exactly why Blast exists, right? We share the same principle of trying to make golfers better, trying to help you do this. The feedback portion of it is a huge, huge um, pillar to what we do, right? You, you can make four great swings or five great swings, and then all of a sudden you hit the ball sideways and you have no idea why or you're rolling putts, whatever part of your game it is. Our goal is to give you instant feedback to inform, not to tell you what to do, but to provide you with information that helps you make an informed decision and go to then your protocols and learn how to do that stuff. So I totally agree with the feedback portion of it. Um, I will pull up my screen. Let's see if this works. Technology is always uh, a little bit of a gamble on these. And as, as Greg's oh, pulling that up, uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're the technology experts here. See, look at that. That looks great. So um, as soon as you, you know, have the Blast app installed on your phone and you have the sensor connected to it via Bluetooth, um, this is what it's going to look like. Greg, you want to just walk us through some of the new changes that we added in here with air swing mode and how you can actually get in there and pull up the super speed clubs? Yeah, so this is the home screen, if you will. Um, the top button here where it says full screen, full screen is where you choose your modes. So we have putting, full swing, short game, bunker mode, and then newly developed and, and with a lot of encouragement and help from the super speed team, air swings. So to be able to, to take a full swing, not have an impact and capture data uh, was something that I think really changed the way we can we can partner together and made this something that was really, really a good partnership. So I'm back on here. You can see I'm in full swings. I'm in air mode, air swings mode, and I'm going to hit just swing down here in the bottom middle of my screen. This is a message from Superspeed that says, hey, if this is your first time doing this, we recommend you baseline your driver swing speed before you start your training. I think this is a great addition. You could then jump in there, see where your starting point is which will allow you then to track your data and see your gains as you go through the protocols um, with super speed. So I'm gonna say no for now. This is gonna pull up a metric layout that is gonna show me swing speed, my peak hand speed and swing tempo. All of my other metrics will be down here, but through Siri, they will read you, she will read you or it will read you your first metric. So. I'm going to step to the right here and take a swing and we'll see this populate with what the data is. Hang on one sec. All right, Greg, you better let it rip. This is a speed webinar. <laughs> swing speed, 106 miles per hour. Okay, right, so that's great. And you can see how that popped up. You've got a number of different metrics there. I think you can customize a lot of this screen as well. What's yeah, also it, great in the feedback side is, did you hear how the app, so Siri on your iPhone, actually tells you the swing speed back. So like if you have this on and down while you're going through your speed training, if you don't even have to look at it while you're going through the training, it'll tell you if you went faster. Yeah, it's a great point. And what you see on here is, right, swing speed is in blue because I have yet to set a goal on what my swing speed is. So, you know, I would set a goal here by clicking update goals and I can simply slide that back and forth and say 106 is as low as I want to be. Obviously, I'd love to be swinging 140, but I set the top at whatever I want it to be. And then as I go through, I'll see a red, yellow, or green that indicates if I'm within my goal range, if I'm close to my goal range, or I'm outside of my goal range. And you can do that with swing tempo as well. So if I scroll up here, I can see what made up that tempo metric is my backswing time, my downswing time, and my total swing time. I can toggle air swings on and or off. I can also switch clubs. So I just click the top. I can move from medium to heavy to light and change my clubs as I'm going through my protocols. And the beauty of what we designed with super speed is this will capture both dominant and non-dominant swings without having to make a change at all. 
So I can take my three swings right-handed, switch to left-handed, take my three swings. After I hit that six swings, I'll get a pop-up that says, do you still wanna use this medium speed trainer or are you ready to switch to heavy or back to light? So with Super Speed's help, they gave us these prompts to help guide you through their protocols that isn't gonna require a bunch of tips or a bunch of uh, taps all over the screen. Yeah, having our actual training content, content integrated into this app is one of the really cool aspects of this. So not only can you come in and just do individual swings with your driver to get your club head speed while you're getting a ball or a baseline, but then you can select our level one speed training. It'll tell you which clubs to use and walk you right through that process. So we've tried to make this again as simple and easy for everybody to use as possible. So um, yeah, I think very, very cool. Tyler, do you yeah. have a little bit you could add on, on some of the practical use of this? Yeah. Yeah. So I think as we look at that, and I think Greg uh, outlined that really beautifully, um, and, and uh, in terms of non-dominant swings, again, for those of you who are maybe not as familiar with our programming, uh, that basically means if I'm a right-handed golfer, I'm going to do three swings right-handed and then three swings left-handed. That's what we mean with those non-dominant swings. And so just to be clear on that and in the practical way to kind of to kind of do this is what we can encourage you to do is just kind of get multiple caps for the top of the club. So now you can actually buy those where you get three caps and the little sensor with it. And then the beauty of it is now all you need to do is you can just easily quickly pop in and out this cap. So I'm gonna tilt my camera down a little bit so we can see this process. Okay, so basically if I've got the sensor here, I can fold this back on itself right like that, pop it right up and bam, my sensor's in that club. I take my six swings with that club, dialogue would pop up and tell me, hey, do you wanna switch your active club? I'd say, perfect, I was with the medium blue club. I'm gonna go ahead and just pop this down, pops out really quickly, take my red club, fold it down over itself, sensor back on, pops right back up, right? Now, again, I may have made that look really easy because I do have a PhD. Um, <laughs> it's gonna take you a, a, maybe a few uh, times to do that, but it really is as slick as that. Uh, you make those quick changes um, and you can move through the entire protocols. It takes you back to the green club at the end for your 39 swings. Um, and it's been really fun to utilize this with golfers, utilize it in my own training. Uh, and, and those are just kind of some practical tips with that. Yeah, yeah, Tyler, you mentioned too, or Mike, you mentioned, you know, if you want to change layouts, I just tap this metric metric layout and I can have a circle graph, which I showed you. I could put four metrics up or six metrics up. Um, there's some built-in layouts here. If I want to change the metric order and I want to see tempo first, I simply drag that up to the top, move that down to the bottom, or if I want to put one of these other metrics in there, so you can kind of customize it to what you want to see. You can set your own goals. And there's also a video. If you want to video yourself swinging, it'll clip the video automatically into six second um, slow motion clips of your swings. So if you want to see if my form is, is maintaining during my training, uh, that's another thing you can do as well. When I close this out, it's going to ask me if I want to add notes. I could simply say in here, backyard swing, during webinar, so I know exactly what that swing was, or I don't wanna add notes, I end my practice, and it'll give me a summary of what that session was. So if that was 20 swings, you'd see 20 individual shots here, and I can scroll through and see my averages, low, average, and high for each one of those things. Now, can I, I wanna show one thing again. I, I'm, a, I'm a data junkie. Uh, that's kind of what I've done, uh, you know, kind of my whole career educationally, and now in in this this kind of research arm with with every sport, and now golf, which I love. Um, I want to show you something I think is really important because I think there's two aspects of this that's really helpful to the golfer. The very first one is the feedback that I think we've touched on really well, but the second one is this kind of long term tracking, so that you can look back and start to see those gains that you've made. So I'm just going to kind of walk Greg through something that I like to really utilize a lot. Uh, to maybe dive not so far into the weeds, but far enough that you can get some good feedback. So Greg's going to click on that kind of hamburger icon sign in the top left. And if he clicks on player report, this is a really cool function that the Blast app has where we can actually go in and set our own pers personal filters. 
So this is where we're going to click on the, I, I call it the little blue kind of wine glass looking thing there. He's going to click on that. And what this allows us to do is say, okay, let's click on the quick filters. And now we can set this up for whatever filters we want. So we're going to click on all swings and we're going to say, well, I just want to see how my, how my air swings are looking. So he's going to click on the all swings and he's going to be able to switch. Let's just change that to air swings. Okay. Now that he's got its air swings, he's going to go to his equipment type. And again, you can do air swings with any club, but in this one, we want to go to the training aids because that's going to be the super speed clubs. And then the last one on the all equipment, he's going to select, well, maybe I want to see how my light swings are going or my medium swings are going, whatever it might be. And then the key here is now we can actually look at all of the metrics or we can even really dial in to maybe an individual metric. So right now what we're getting is the nine swings that, that he's had. We get every single individual swing right here, all of the things like backswing time and tempo and those types of things. So I really like this a lot. Greg, if you can click on that filter again, there's, there's kind of one other thing. If you go to the all metrics and averages and just look at swing speed, this is probably one of my favorites that we have. So if we hit go and take a look at this, now what we get is just a graph of our swing speeds. And, and currently right now, we have that dated from October 5th to 20th. Okay, Greg just kind of started his speed training, but this is something that you could track out for one month, three months, six months, you know, customize, and you can start looking at the fastest you've moved that, the average, the low, just what an incredible way to track this. If you're doing drivers regularly to assess those speeds, this is a great place to keep track of all those drivers and look back and say, wow, yeah, I picked up five miles per hour in the last six weeks. So this, I think this is a cool feature of the Blast app that I really love to use. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think the progress tracking piece is really cool. Like we had so many people over the years send us these detailed like Excel spreadsheets of every swing they've ever made. And now it can all be done. If you want all of that data, you can do it all automatically and you don't have to capture anything yourself. So really cool stuff. Lots of stuff in this Blast app. You know, Greg, there's more to it than just the air swings. I don't want to go, we could probably spend another two hours talking about the other features of this app, but it can definitely help you with other aspects of your game as well. Yeah, um, you know, we're, we're very strong in putting, obviously. That's where we kind of got our roots. Um, timing and tempo being a, a basis for not only putting, but short game, full swing, bunker mode. So we measure a lot of that stuff. And, and to your point, and as a teacher, Mike and, and, and Tyler, you know, if anything, your teaching is rooted in tempo, right, that they're doing it within the right tempo, they're going to get better faster. And, you know, training with feedback is just that much better practicing with purpose than just going out there blindly smashing a bucket of balls or rolling 50 putts and not knowing why you made it or missed it. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you, you know, super speed helps you get closer to the hole. And then we can really help you from when you get closer to the hole by getting it in the hole. Um, and it's a, it's a good partnership in that sense. So explore the app. Um, you know, if you're, if you're sending in questions or have follow-up questions, we're happy to answer them, but it's a fantastic little product for, for what it is in terms of its size and, and the power that it, it has. Yeah. And if you, uh, if you purchase the blast system through super speed golf, um, it actually comes with those three extra caps. So you're already set to go if you're you're buying that from us on on using that right with your super speed club. Yeah, Mike, let me show one other thing real quick. I'm going to reshare my screen real fast because I forgot to show this, and I think it's uh, important. In our training center down here, bottom left hand corner, if I click on training center, we have all of the protocols for super speed right here within the app. So you don't have to jump over to your computer or, or switch apps within your phone. Everything is here to be able to pull those up and go through your protocols at whatever level you're at, as well as the warmups in there. So I think that was a great addition to this to keep everybody, you know, efficient in your training and everything all in one place. Absolutely. Absolutely. And like I said, the walkthrough process where it really holds the player's hand through is, is great as well. But if you want to, if you need to go through and actually watch the video, of the protocols, you can do all that right there in the app. Right. All right. I think uh, I think we should dive into some of these questions we're getting. Uh, we got a bunch of good ones. Few of them that you know Tyler and I I think could probably spend four or five hours talking about uh, for sure as it regards to super speed. But you know let, let's let's get going. Um, Kyle, you want to just go down the list here and read them, or or how you want to do it? Yeah, I had just one more input that I think is super important. Greg, you brought it up is the ability to film your swing. It, 
this is one of the coolest things that anyone's doing out there. And I think it's overlooked a lot with this app. Greg, can you just tell a little bit more about the specifics of that? Because I've never used anything like this before. And it, it changes the game when it comes to how the Blast app can be used with super speed, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I tell a lot of coaches, look, buy a sensor, download the app. If you're just going to use the video function and the sensor, it's fantastic. So we have a lot of IP around auto curation, meaning I could set up my phone on a tripod with 30 golf balls and go through my training of whatever I'm doing. I could talk to Tyler in between. I could have a beer. I can continue hitting. Meanwhile, I haven't touched anything other than record one time. At the end of that session, I will end up with 30 individual clips, six seconds automatically curated into slow motion with whatever metrics I want overlaid over the top. So it'll dynamically build my club head speed or my time from start to finish. There are markers for backswing start, downswing start and impact, and it's all in slow motion that can easily be shared, posted, sent to your coach, posted on your social media, whatever you wanna do. But it, it's an awesome function that's kind of hidden within the app that allows you to do a lot of things, including video analysis and drawing lines and all that good stuff. So thanks, Kyle, for bringing that up. Yeah, thanks, Greg. It's, it's really cool to actually see some of your super speed swings. A lot of people don't actually film those. So kind of cool thing there. Okay, uh, getting the questions. Mike, you want to start with this uh, first one, Absolutely. Michael Lally. Um, yeah, we've had this one before, and it's good to bring it up now that we uh, have quite a bit of data on our end. So kick that over to maybe Tyler and then Mike jump in. or who yeah, else uh, first? Let me just say that real quick. So so the question, if you don't have your Q&A pan, panel up, is that um, – Looks like a, uh, a group called Par for Success did a study um, that showed some better results with just using the blue club and less reps. Um, we've done a lot of our own studies at Superspeed and then Tyler, again, being at a university and doing research for a living, has also done a ton of different studies on this. So I wanna just preface it with this. There are a lot of ways to use our super speed golf training products that we do not have on our website and don't recommend to the masses that are going to that are going to use these products. That doesn't necessarily mean that people aren't still going to get good results with some of those different different drill positions or different training protocols. There's a lot of different subtle variations you could do on this in our testing we've found that the optimal range, we need to be a little bit lighter than the blue club to get optimal amounts of speed gain. And we also need a few more reps than half of the reps of that, that protocol in order to really build permanency with that. Tyler can speak you know, more to the actual studies he's done as well. Yeah, again, just, just quickly, and, and I've, I've read a lot of the stuff those guys do at Par 4 Success. They do great work. Uh, and again, I think what Mike's bringing up is, is our goal is to to program the speed training aspect of how people would train physically, right? So the only things I'm ever doing in my study are just straight up following the protocols as we've researched and outlined them. That way we know exactly how they work in a vacuum without anything else. So, you know, it, it was, it, we weren't changing anything about med ball throws and jumps and power cleans and, and hip hinge and things like that, which can all be good for a, for a golf swing, of course. All I was doing was looking at those protocols walking through them exactly as they were outlined. And, and what I love to see at the end of my study, there's some great research out there on, uh, not to get too statistical, but I have to mention this because I think it's really fascinating where you look at some of those other studies where you're doing a ton of gym work and med ball throws, which again, is, is such a good thing. And, and we encourage everyone to incorporate that into their speed training. But if you look at a statistical marker called the effect size, basically means how effective was that training stimulus uh, and the effect sizes in my studies were equal to the effect sizes of some of these in this literature review where there was the whole med ball throw and all these different kind of things. The only difference was my players were only training for 45 minutes a week. And in those studies, typically they're training for three to four hours a week. And so I think it's awesome from an effect standpoint, the specificity of speed training, um, the way it's outlined green, blue, red. I just continue to see results uh, in, in my research. So. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. I want to kick this one over to Greg. I think it's a great question from Stephen. Uh, Greg, can you talk a little bit about the other metrics that uh, when you're actually hitting full shots and hitting a ball, what blast measures? He's specifically asking about face to path, which is not one of them, but there's some other really cool metrics that it does provide. Yeah, absolutely. So 
you know, with fa on a full swing club, we, we don't, we can measure where the face is, but we're not comfortable that it's as accurate as it needs to be because there is so much deflection going on with a long shaft or a driver or through that impact mode. So we do do that in putting. We measure face, rotation, open, closed, and at impact. Um, one of the other metrics that Tyler, you can jump in here too, is, is peak hand speed, which was a very interesting one because we did see a correlation when looking at elite player data that with a driver and almost through their bag, their peak hand speed was about 20% of their club head speed. And the metric and how we report it is where that peak hand speed occurs in relation to your downswing. So there's, there's an area between 60 and 80% of the downswing time where elite players release the club or transfer that energy into the club head. And so that's what we set the goal at. And it's a good indication of if you're peaking early, you may be casting. If you're peaking late, you may be hanging on and, and dragging the handle through the impact zone. Um, so you try to stay and live in that area. The, the other big one is timing and tempo. So everybody's going to have an optimum timing and tempo for their own swing, depending on the shot they're hitting. For a driver, we, we say a, a standard is about three to one. So your backswing time should take three times as long as your downswing time. But what we encourage is if I was watching Mike hit and when he's hitting drivers exactly how he wants to hit them, I note where his tempo is and say it's 2.5 to one. That's what I'm going to set his goal at. And then he trains to repeat that with his driver swing every single time. Maybe different with his mid irons, maybe different with his putter. I've worked with pros who are the same throughout the bag, which is a bit of a rarity but they have dialed in what it feels like to move that club, whatever it is, at a certain rhythm and tempo, and they master it. Um, the other one more I'll add, sorry to, to delay, is angle of attack. Mm -hmm. So the ability to measure what your angle of attack is through the ball, really, really important throughout your bag. Um, in short game, we see it as a critical factor to not hitting it fat or blading it over the green. So Again, finding where your ideal angle of attack is. The goals we have set are based on millions of shots from elite players and PGA Tour, LPGA Tour, Champions Tour, DP World Tour data that we have um, to get you into that zone of where the club should be moving. I'll say one thing there too, just on the data side. It is incredibly important whenever you're dealing with a technology or a sensor or anything like that, to know what it's measuring, how it's measuring, and how accurate it is. What Greg said a little bit ago is like, we can measure face angle, but we don't feel comfortable giving it to you because there's too many other factors. It's not quite as accurate as we would like. And then they don't give it to you. That's like the absolute, like perfect thing that you want a technology company to tell you. If a company tells you we're measuring all these metrics, we think they're pretty good and they're good enough. That's when I look at a technology and I run the other way as fast as I possibly can. And one of the reasons we really like working with Blast because these guys really care about the quality of their data. Absolutely. That was awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, let's jump into Mike and uh, Tyler here. We have a lot of people that are going to be starting up in their off-season training either already or getting there. You know, if they've already... Uh, started where should are they already started and then they stopped where should they start kind of maybe talk about what our protocols are like how the best get into a new training cycle versus uh if they've already started and how to integrate blast with that i would just say follow the program right tyler so like it, <laughs> this is the way i would put it on this one we have three separate training cycles that manage you know the way you go through our protocols and you can go to the training tab on our website access all of this content for free if you've completed a training cycle, meaning you've gotten yourself into the maintenance phase of the level one training cycle, you know, and you took some time off, I would recommend getting back in and starting with the level two training cycle. If you stopped three weeks into the level into the first training cycle and you took some time off, I'd start that training cycle over. That, that's kind of where I would go. Tyler, would you agree yeah, with that? Yeah, and let me just add this one piece about speed training, right? Like. The, the number one predictor of your ability to gain speed this off season is going to be 
your adherence to the program, meaning, you know, do you actually do it and do you do it as outlined? And I think the second big one is, are you doing it at the proper intensity? Are you really trying to make these things go as fast as possible? And I get a lot of emails and interact with a lot of golfers who say, you know, well, well what, what's the secret? What's this other stuff? And it's like, well, there really isn't a secret. You, you just keep doing it and you do it over and over again and you continue to do it or you'll lose that speed, just like any physical capacity. And I, what I think is great about it is when you can dedicate 45 minutes a week to your golf game, it makes it easier to continue doing this uh, in season, off season, year after year. I do like the idea of these maintenance phases that Mike brought up where you might give your body a little bit of a time to kind of ramp down. But instead of losing speed when you do that, just keep training once a week. I think that's a big mistake. Don't don't just totally stop doing this. If, if you have to pause, try and do it once a week to, to maintain those benefits and then jump back in and get to the three days a week. But but just do it and stick to it and, and the gains are there. Kyle, I love this next question. I think Greg hit on it as well. Um, the idea about hand speed and hand speed translating. Yep. Um, I don't want to get us off into a tangent here for about the next 45 minutes, but we've just finished doing a huge study. Tyler just finished doing a huge study all about grip strength. And if you stay tuned to our super speed channels very soon, you may be seeing some new stuff coming from us that are going to help players with grip strength. But I would say that would be one of the very common reasons that you may be able to create high peak hand speed during your swing and not have it translate into club speed is that that connection between your hands and the club is not quite strong enough to be able to manage the forces required to translate hand speed into club speed. So a whole lot more on that coming soon. I think we'll probably do a webinar all about that here within the next month and a half. I think a uh, little peek under the tent, like Blast and Superspeed have been talking for, for a, quite some time, not, not just recently. Um, and when we released peak hand speed and Tyler piqued his interest to use the word, um, that got our conversations much deeper because we had done some studies. He had done a lot of deep studies into peak hand speed. It's a pretty interesting metric. Um, and, and you can definitely see some differences between a an elite ball striker and a hey i'm just fanning at the ball and and not creating any any speed yeah so can check i ask that out grip strength um another one would maybe check out the c club training mm -hmm. c club training is kind of designed to work on translating you know body type speed into the arms and hands so uh you could check that training out as well it is more designed for translation of those high speeds in the body Greg, one quick question in the Blast app, because I know you report out peak hand speed, and you already beautifully mentioned the research you've done and that's been done about the proper timing of that peak hand speed. Um, I know when I log into the portal with some of the you know accounts I have, I can I can spit out a continuous curve of hand speed and look at that. Um, do you guys have or or are in plans of of coming out with the timing of when that peak hand speed is occurring? Well, if you look at the the metric layout, when you go to like hand speed training or speed training, there is a, you know, your your goal range is set within that 60 to 80 oh. level. So there, there was another question I saw come through about the dashes on the, on the three circle graph. That's simply your goal, right? So the green bar tells you, yes, I was in my goal. And if I was at the very end of those dashes, I'm almost out of my goal. If I was at the very beginning, I'm just into my goal. So that's what those dashes represent. And as I mentioned, the reason it was blue on that one is because I hadn't set a specific goal. But, you know, off season training near and dear to our heart as well, because one, you can roll putts anywhere. Two, if you got room and you don't want to hit a ball, air swing modes allows you to swing a club anywhere or your speed trainers anywhere. And the ability to dial in a specific distance or a specific distance speed, once you realize, hey, to hit a 50 yard pitch shot, I need to swing my 50 degree wedge, 56 degree wedge, 48 miles an hour. I could very easily train to what 48 feels like. And it goes all the way back, Mike, to your discovery yeah. learning. I'm training a feel of what 48 miles an hour feels like or 50 miles an hour feels like. Now, when I get to the course and I'm faced with that shot, it's a no brainer. All I just gotta do is gauge my lie. Do I have to go high over something or can I play it how I've been doing it? But I know exactly how hard to swing. 
All right, Greg, I got a feature you got to add. So I don't know how many people on this webinar have seen me coach super speed before, but I tend to get a little aggressive getting the player to kind of move through it and be aggressive with it. There's got to be a way that we can like set the goal range. And if you didn't get up to the goal range, like you didn't get there, we got to have a way for Siri to just scream at you through the phone, right? Love it. Love it. We can get Siri to say pretty much anything. All right. Well, that's <laughs> coming like then. That. You're going to have digital, digital yelling. Um, if you're not going aggressively enough in your super speed training, coming soon. You heard it here. The, sen the sensor heats up your grip and gives you a shock. <laughs> <laughs> We're just kidding, by the way. That, but I mean, the, the yelling thing, maybe not. Um, C Club protocol is the next question on here. Um, the C Club is not available in the Blast app yet. Um, we've been doing a lot of testing on the C Club in the app. Um, because of the extra distance behind the player's hands and that extra piece of rubber, we're having a little bit more trouble getting the data to be as accurate as we want it to be. So uh, we are hopeful that in the future we will be able to include the C-Club protocols. Know that there is a lot of work going on behind the scenes to try to make that happen. So uh, we'll just uh, continue with that. As what we have now is just the overspeed training sets. Hey, it's a great point though, right? We worked together. We said, hey, we're seeing some anomalies here because the weight's moving. And we said, as a team, hey, let's not put it out there unless we're a thousand percent that we're giving players the right data. Yep. And just for everyone, this will be recorded. We have several uh, people asking. So it's recording right now. It'll be sent out tomorrow to everyone who's currently on here or those that registered. Uh, Greg, we just have uh, some good questions here about the app. A lot of yeah. people that are either already have it or wanting some feedback if they actually do purchase it. So you can see some of these. Uh, maybe you can talk about, they're asking why my app looks different. We have an Android version and a iOS version. That might be it. I don't know if there's any other reason they might be seeing something different on theirs than what yeah, you were. There, there's a couple questions, right? Within the free app that you can download, everything is included in there. The player reports that Tyler and I are seeing is part of coach mode. So that is a, a premium service to get that graphing. And it's $100 per year. So it's not a, a big investment. Um, we'll go back behind the scenes and see if we can open that up for super speed users, uh, because I do think there's a lot of, of benefit there. But the app itself, um, there is not a yearly subscription unless you wanna look at your data online, where you can be on a portal and see all your data in one place. You could do a player subscription, which is $59 per year or $5 per month. Um, or if you're a coach and you want to add players to Academy, Blast has a whole backend system that allows you to coach remotely and do a lot of things um, that most golfers wouldn't use on their own, but coaches and academies could use to operationalize uh, a, a large group of students. Yeah, like for example, if you were at my academy and I asked you to do your speed training three days a week, I'd put you in my deal. And if I saw that you didn't do it, you'd be getting a phone call and I'd be seeing what was going on. That's exactly that right. Kind we of have thing. a lot of people that will give an assignment or coaches that will give an assignment. And if they're part of the academy when they're both premium subscribers, I could see if Mike's doing his reps on my phone and I can call him and say, dude, what's going what's on? What's going on? Not anything. Yeah. Hey, Greg, quick question, just because we were, we were out at the Southern California uh, Teaching and Coaching Summit. And I got this question a lot from users who have Blast. I know you have different generations of the sensor. Um, what's the generation that they have to have in order for the air swings mode to work? It's generation three, which has been the one that's been on sale for about a year now. Um, it's a smaller form factor. The original sensor had, it was a little bit bigger, call it a quarter size instead of a nickel size. Um, and the gen three has all new guts, if you will, and new algorithms to be able to capture air swings. So when you register your sensor, it'll say Gen 3. When you go to my sensors from the main menu, it'll have parentheses and say Gen 3. Um, and that'll let you know that, yes, you can enable air swings on that. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, we have some, some tech guys on here that are asking, could I use it on the course? Could I use it in conjunction with Arcos or say shot scope sensors. Um, love to hear how you guys use that on course or if anyone uses that. Yeah, I'll say, you know, I have it on my putter. All the, I have a couple sensors, obviously. I have one on my putter and one on my driver all the time. And I will sync it, go play around a round of golf, 
come back and upload all the data and see if what I'm working on at home is translating to on course. So there's three modes. There's live training mode where Siri is reading you numbers. A lot of players that put in AirPods go through their training and, and listen to their feedback. There's offline mode, which is sync it, leave the phone at home, go play golf, come back and re-upload all your actions, or there's video mode. Um, I have put it over an Arcos sensor and it works fine, it captures that data. I don't use it live on the golf course. Um, I'm always in offline mode while I'm playing. Um, and it's not, you can play with it in a tournament. So we like to joke <coughs> and say the USGA won't make it conforming because it gives you too much good data. Um, although we can turn it off in the background. There's not many tour pros looking at their phones during their round of golf. Um, but it does provide pretty good insights, um, whether you're translating your, your training on course or not. It's quite incredible that the numbers will change from the arriving range to on course and situationally. So I think that's something that's a whole new feature for super speed and blast users. Yeah, it's, and it's not just golf. You know, we do baseball and softball as well. And, you know, swing off a tee is different than a swing in game. Believe it or not, the swing in game slows down when there's a ball moving at you at 100, and 100 miles an hour and curving. The swing tends to slow down. And on the golf course, you see some of that as well, too. Perfect. Greg, I'm going to feed you two more and then we'll jump into a couple more training questions. So yeah. uh, obviously people like this video feature. Where can they find that or access that in the app? So there's a little camera icon in the bottom right-hand corner. You just click on that camera icon and it'll connect to your camera. When you register, you have to give the app access to your camera, but it'll ask you for access. If you haven't done that, it goes on and then you simply hit record at whatever angle you wanna do it at. Perfect. And then someone asked about how many sensors versus caps, just to clarify, there's one sensor that comes with it and then caps, there's a putter cap and a, a club cap. And then we have extra three caps that go on each of your super speed clubs. So we don't have 12 or 14 caps that you or uh, sensors that you'd be using. You're using one sensor. And you're just moving it from whatever club you're hitting or whatever super speed club you're using during that training. Correct. There's a standard size uh, cap, which is this one. And then there's one that's slightly oversized for typically a, an oversized grip or a midsize grip or a putter grip um, that's larger. And to Tyler's point, it's not the easiest thing in the world to get on there for a reason. We want it to stay still, we want it to stay on, and we don't want it to fly when you're swinging or move when you're swinging. So it takes a little practice to get used to it. Once you've done it, you know, five or six times, it becomes second nature, and you can start moving things around pretty easily. Yeah, from an overspeed training standpoint, that's why we sell the extra club caps. Yeah, so the it's club caps are actually harder to get on the grip than the sensor is to get out of the club cap. So we found when we did some market testing on that, that it made it really easy and just fluid to go through the training that you just leave club caps on all your super speed clubs and then you just pop the sensor in and out and it's really simple. There yeah, was there a was... question as well earlier, I think I'm not sure if we got there about the orientation of the sensor. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to jump on that. I, I typed an answer. I don't know if I did it right, but if you can see the logo here, we call this logo the Blast Man. So on super speed it does not have to be in any orientation you can put it on there grip it any way you want it and start taking hacks if you're training with a golf club or a putter it needs to be this blast man needs to be faced up as i'm looking down the club so he should be kind of standing straight up and down with the body if you will this part aligned with the face of the club um, but with super speed training it does not need to be aligned any any specific way perfect okay got a couple more training questions so tyler do you see this one uh, that you mentioned half training a week mm -hmm. versus three to four hours yeah What's so the research shown yep go ahead yeah so i have to say it was kind of a question just about you know we get this question a lot like if well if if 45 minutes a week is great uh two hours a week of speed training would be even better and and uh, what we've just found repeatedly is that that's really not the case, uh, because the other thing I talk about is the idea of making sure that you have the uh, proper intensity and that you're not over fatigued so that you can make fast swings. Um, and this system is not the kind of thing like like if I go do heavy squats in a gym and I haven't done that for a long time or I up my weight or reps like I can't really stand up or sit down without feeling that that kind of pain. Right. Or that soreness you're not going to feel sore after a super speed session. So what you'll start to do is say, 
well, I did this Monday. I'm feeling good. I'm going to do it Tuesday. And then I'm going to do it Wednesday. I'm going to do it Thursday. We just call that overtraining, right? So there's just all the research that we do, everything we see in kind of other fields of research related to this high intensity velocity training points to be well rested, take the full rest three days a week. And, and so don't do more, do less. Perfect, Tyler. And then um, we have several people that are either maybe getting into a season down south, uh, coming off a season and going into off season. So I think one of the big things that we're stressing with, you know, our tour pros that we're working with down to the lower level amateurs, to different populations is should I train all year round? Should I train differently when I'm in season? Uh, could you answer that, especially kind of what you've been seeing with some of the tour pros you've been working with who are playing obviously way more than most people? Yeah, and that, that's kind of the hard thing with, with the tour pros I'm working with. It, it's like we start to map out their schedule and it's like, hey, I'm coming into the off season. I'm like, perfect, how long is your off season? And they're like, it's two hours. You know, I mean, they just are playing so much really. So what we've started to do with them is really we've started to kind of weave in these maintenance phases. And that's the beauty of the maintenance phase. You know, the research suggests you just have to do speed training one day a week to retain benefits. You got to do it three days a week to gain, but one day a week just to retain benefits. And so this is where we'll create these times where, you know, maybe a tour player will be training, you know, for five, six, seven weeks, three days a week. And then they're coming into a time where they're training, where they have three uh, weeks in a row of tournaments. Well, the worst thing we can do is totally stop doing speed training, but we also don't want them fatigued for those tournaments. And so this is where we go to one day a week and what's been really cool in my work with them is we don't see their speeds drop at all. When they come back and start, we start testing speeds again, they're at the same speeds they were uh, than before they went to that one day a week. And so I really think it's the kind of training that you can do year round as long as you're following those cycles. And I know we probably preach this a lot, but we spent a lot of time researching these, testing it on a lot of individuals. So do the three days a week. And then after those 10 weeks, come down, give yourself a little break, but don't just stop, right? Keep doing that one day a week. I would say pro approximately two thirds of the active tour players in the world have or are working with a system with overspeed training or super speed golf right now. I would say that a very low percentage of them, uh, I would say less than 5% stop. I would say the vast majority are doing it year round. Um, they're just going through periods of those more intense primary training phases, and they're going into maintenance phases. And those maintenance phases may last for two or three months at a time. Like, they could be an extended period of time where they're in a maintenance phase. Um, but, yeah, I would recommend just making it a part of your normal routine. That's what we see with the best players in the world. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then this is a great question, maybe our last one here, about uh, recommendations on rest between swings. Tyler's been heavily leading that charge. I have some great information on that as to what we're recommending and how the app uh, does that. Yeah, so again, this was something I, I played around with. Nothing was off the table when we were redoing protocols in my lab. This was, uh, gosh, two summers ago, maybe. Um, and so I looked at everything under the sun in terms of rest periods. So I tried rests after every swing. I tried rests uh, going from dominant to non-dominant between every single set. And what I found works the very best was that you would take a rest period before every time you went to the heavy club. So you would use the light and the medium, and then you would take that about 90 second, two minute rest, and then you would go into those heavy clubs. Uh, when I took more rests, um, you just, you didn't see any uptick in speed. And actually in some of those scenarios, you actually saw it go down in speed. There's something about getting into a little bit of a rhythm like Mike talked about, you either the speed gets called out to you and blast, you feel what that's like, go right into your next swing, and you start getting into a rhythm of what speed feels like. Uh, but again, if you do too many in a row, you will start to get fatigued. And so the proper rest period is about 90 seconds to two minutes right before the red club. Um, and uh, th that's kind of where we suggest it, it be had. Awesome. For anyone asking about... Uh what the package is, how much it costs, where it is, I put it in the chat. So it includes the, the uh, blast sensor, the putting cap, a cap for your clubs, and then three extra grip caps. That's the one uh, on our website. If you wanna check that out in the chat function and click on that, that'll get you there. I think uh, that's pretty good though, Mike. Okay, well, I really appreciate everybody hanging out with us this afternoon. I hope you you know learned some cool information about how to get feedback and track your progress with speed training. Uh, big thanks to uh, Dr. Tyler out in Utah and Greg uh, from Blast for being with us. Uh, 
until next time, I think we'll uh, move on to some more things this evening. Uh, back with speed training, and I'm going to go get my blast sensor and actually start putting some of my <laughs> own data in. So uh, it should be a lot of fun. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for having us. See you guys. Thank you.